Hello, my name is Bruce Devlin. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Amberfin. Amberfin, if anybody's been paying attention to the press here at the show, is now a Dillette company. So today I'm giving a presentation on behalf of Dillette Amberfin about the business case for delivery and control standards. Now I wanted to talk about the business case because very often when we talk about uh, standards like FIMS, like the application specifications from the AMWA, we talk about the technology, but few people actually explain why it's a really good idea and why it makes good business sense, not just for the vendor community like Dillette and Amberfin, but also for the end users. So let's start off with a little bit of history. I'm going to talk about MXF, and for those of you who have had severe pain implementing MXF systems, I am truly sorry, but it seemed like a very good idea at the time. I was the guy that led the MXF committees in the SMPTE to try and create a file format that was the general workhorse for the industry. Now in 2004, we finally finished writing those standards down and publishing them. Up until that point, we'd spent about six years in big committees, sometimes we had 300 different end users all providing input to what MXF should be and what MXF should do. The trouble is, when you're writing a standard, some of the actual writing of the documents and the nitty gritty of fighting over the fine detail of each of the lines of the thousand pages of specification, it's a bit tedious and boring. So by the time we got to 2004, the only people left in the committees were about 11 different vendors and two of those didn't show up very often. So the user input at that phase in MXF's development had completely disappeared, probably for about 18 months to two years. And that's understandable because it's pretty grim and tedious doing that kind of stuff. But what happened is that in 2004, when all the MXF products got launched, you ended up with maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven different variants of MXF, all using the different tools within the standard for the vendors to differentiate themselves. Now, for an interoperable standard, that was not good. It wasn't our finest hour, it's got to be said. So the fine folks of the AMWA, um, of which I was a very active one at the time, and I do apologize for not turning up to too many meetings recently, but I've been busy. Um, we sat down and we, we looked at things like application specifications. How do you take this toolbox and include things like VANC, include things like working around the bugs that were in the specification and actually deliver a useful specification that solves a business problem? And that was the key. It was solving a business problem. And first we had to define what those business problems were. And coming out of the AMWA, there were a series of different specifications. And one of the uh, latest ones is one called AS11 that has been taken by the United Kingdom and turned into a thing called the Digital Production Partnership Delivery Specification. And this really explains how you can get a standard to get traction and deliver good business value. So MXF had been a standard since 2004. We patched it in 2006 to add support for VANC. In 2009 and 2011, we patched it to fix some of the bugs in the specification. AMWA's AS11 specification came out around that sort of time, which said, if you're going to be contributing content between different media organizations, this is how you should use the MXF standard. And fortuitously, some people in the United Kingdom, specifically the BBC, Sky, Channel 4, Channel 5, pretty much all the broadcasters and post houses, sat down and said, what do we have to do to get rid of tape? And they came up with a way to use the AMWA and the MXF specifications to solve a very specific business problem, i.e. let's get rid of tape in the interchange of media between different organizations. And that's really key because they had to not only control the video and the audio, but also metadata and all sorts of other things. It's really key this year, 2014, that the DPP has a good solid specification because on the 15th of October this year, there'll be no more tape interchange in the United Kingdom. Now that's a big business opportunity for the vendors because suddenly a whole bunch of post houses, um, production houses, broadcasters, and other facilities have to tool up to get true file-based interoperability for one single standard. I'll come back to that a little bit later. It's worth looking at why we're looking at standards for doing this and not just doing one-to-one -one interoperability between companies. 
If you have a neutral interoperable standard, you don't have any one winner. You don't have a Sony format tape or a Panasonic format tape dominating the industry. You get true interoperability, which allows innovation from smaller companies. You have to include all the ugly things. Captions, ugh, file-based captions for anybody who's done it generates more gray hair than just about anything that I can imagine. It's even worse than writing the MXF specification. Sorry for you caption fanatics, I apologize. If you've got an open standard with lots of vendors and lots of users working together, you should get better interoperability. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that business is about more than just a file format. And it's worth looking at the business reasons about why having a file format amongst a community or inside one application is good. Let's imagine the use case of four different companies, creatively named A, B, C, and D. Imagine that you're trying to interchange a file between these different companies, and you use different files for each leg of the interchange. Well, the first thing is you're trying to deliver entertainment at the back end of company D. You've had to transcode your file a number of times, it just in order to do this file interchange. So at the very least, you've got one, two, three different transcodes going on. So you've had three generation losses. So just by not agreeing on file formats, you've reduced the end quality to the end consumer. And as many surveys tell you, the worse the end quality is, the less likely your content is to be sticky. You have to be even better at your storyline if you make a mess of the picture quality. But also, for each one of these interchanges, how many man weeks of engineering does it take to write all the code to make certain that everything that was in this fo format gets seamlessly transferred to that format? How many man weeks of testing? You have to test not just the products, but the operational workflows, because the people who are actually operating this business environment, they're not file format experts. They haven't read all 1,000 pages of the MXF spec or the 5,000 lines of um, MPEG specification. It's got to be dumb. It's got to be simple. How do you cope with software upgrades? Um, who defines what you need to test in the operational environment? And what's the total cost of all this extra engineering and who pays it? Because it comes as a great surprise to many of my end customers that vendors of software are not charities. And every month of engineering that we have to spend doing something that doesn't add value to our product, we have to put that into our charging model that goes to the end customers. So you can see that suddenly, if you were able to agree on a single standard for a set of interoperable applications, there'd be many times when you wouldn't have to transcode at all. So you've got better quality at the end. There'd be many times when actually you do very few file-based manipulations. So the testing and the man weeks of engineering suddenly disappear. And it may sound a bit weird that as a transcode vendor, I'm recommending don't do transcoding. But at the end of the day, my transcode business only survives if these underlining um, four businesses are healthy and successful. And it makes no business sense to spend money doing stuff that doesn't add value to your business. So that was file specs. It seems that they're a good idea. If you can find the right file spec for an application, that's a good thing. What about control specifications? Well, the weird thing about control specifications is we used to have a small number of them a long time ago. Back in the 1980s, if you had an SDI cable and an RS-422 lead, you could pretty much build a facility of any scale. And then as we've optimized the sorts of software that we have in the industry, that level of interoperable control has completely vanished. So we're in the same environment. If every vendor has to work on a private control strategy between every other vendor, that doesn't scale particularly well. There's a lot of engineering involved there. And then you've got the sustaining costs. Once you build your system, what if one of those vendors then disappears? You've now got a whole big hole in your facility that you can no longer fill. You have to do custom bespoke engineering to fill in for that vendor because nobody else used their control protocol. And it also makes live testing of new bits of equipment very difficult because you have to write a whole bunch of custom code before you can even do your first line of testing. So this has been identified by a number of people, but most importantly, the EBU and the AMWA came together and said, wouldn't it be good if we could get rid of this sort of random one-to-one -one ugly way of controlling um, processes that we do in our industry and replace them with something that's much more 
orchestrated, something where there are defined interfaces and defined control systems that would allow anyone with a capture service or a transform service or a transport service to at least get going very quickly inside any facility. There's obvious speed improvements, obvious time to market improvements, and obvious benefits for the operator of this system because they can now try alternative systems and then that allows them to negotiate on price, it allows them to do all sorts of things that you cannot do in this lock-in model. So I've mentioned a number of delivery and um, a number of file standards. I was just going to very, very quickly mention some of those that are out there that are actually in use that came directly or indirectly from the AMWA. The first is ASO2. ASO2 is a file standard where you've componentized all of your media. And this works really well in very high versioning workflows. If you're going to deliver 100 different variants of your content, ASO2 is optimized for the compact and sophisticated description of lots and lots of different versions, as opposed to ASO3, which is optimized for the delivery of content directly onto playout servers, as opposed to AS10, which is a hardening up of the XDCAM specification, which is optimized for the interchange of content at around the 50 megabit rate, as opposed to AS11, which is the next level up. So this would be great for transmission. This one allows you to do a few more manipulations before you finally get to transmission. So if you take those delivery standards and then look at how they might fit into a managed environment, basically a lot of these services will be, end up acting on media. You get better interoperability and lower execution costs if these verbs, which are described by FIMS, execute on defined nouns, which are defined by the delivery specs. So actually the combination of defined verbs the services that FIMS describes and the delivery specs defined by the application specifications deliver reduced cost and actually improved functionality in your workflows. I'm just going to make one special mention of the FIMS repository service because for me this is going to be one of the game changers. Yes, the FIMS capture service is well understood and the FIMS transfer service is well understood and yes, we need those, but by and large a lot of one-to-one -one interoperable deployments have already happened in the industry. But this is unique. In just about every major project I've been in, the problems have always been around the storage and retrieval of metadata and essence. So the FIMS repository service for me is one of the keys to unblocking some of those problems that I see day after day after day in these deployments because it allows us to have a common framework for the storage and persistence of media objects without custom code having to be written so that this thing over here or that thing over there can get at something down here. It allows true vendor neutral interoperability of finding stuff and getting stuff. FIMS has a data model. Now this is something that a lot of business people go, yeah. But actually, the data model is the key to getting these things right. The data model defines the relationships between stored things and um, things that act on the stored things. And if all the different vendors have the same concept of the representation, it stand, we stand a very good chance of building systems that work first time. I'm coming back to the UK DPP. The UK DPP defined a metadata model. It defined a metadata application and it defined some technical file standards. But actually all they did is put a thin layer of what was good for the UK on top of the underlying standards. And I think this is a great model for other territories and other applications going forwards. Because what it gives you is the ability to plug and play between vendors that have never seen each other. Now the best vendor interoperability days that I've been to in the last two years have been the DPP ones. At the last one we had something like 25 vendors, all in the same room, which wasn't big enough, all throwing files around the place. And it's the only place I know where that number of vendors have a commercial interest to get together and fix an application problem. And if that is the case, if you can get 20 plus vendors in a room for a territory the size of the UK, just think what would happen if you could get a similar standard that had global reach. Just to reinforce the idea that the DPP specification builds on top of other specifications, it was realized that all users are different. I often say that my customers are all special. They all have special needs. The special needs customers have to have something that's special to them. 
But with this hierarchy of specifications, these special needs can be layered either underneath or on top, depending which way up, um, on top of the standards that already exist to give just those little things that the customers do differently into a, um, into a proper framework. Now I'm going to finish off just by talking a little bit about a new standard, which is the Joint Task Force on File Format and Media Interoperability, the JITFIMV. We didn't think this through when we thought the name up, did we? Um, but basically, this is kind of like trying to do for North America and maybe globally what the UK's DPP has done in the UK. It's a task force sponsored by the NABA, AMWA, SIMT, IABM, just about everyone. So there is a need for this thing. And they've started off by collecting user stories. And a user story is a software technique that says, as a whatever role you do, I want to do some sort of function for some sort of business reason. And I've looked at some of the user stories. So here's one. So as a director of production workflow, I want to identify media essence streams at the point of ingest and maintain that identity to the viewer so that that allows for the development of a new class of applications that can identify and assemble media stream to the consumer end. In other words, I bought some content. I'd like to make certain that I broadcast it. And I'd like to make certain that on all my online streams that it got to the consumers unadulterated. Well, that's kind of good business value, isn't it? If I make something, I'd kind of like the consumers to get it. That makes sense. And isn't it surprising that an industry that's nearly 70 years old, we can't actually do that today? It's a bit weird. So as a user, I want to be able to move files to and from different systems. And for these systems to have standard offset counting algorithm to ensure time code, da, 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 you can read these things when we publish them. But basically, this one is saying, as a user, I'd like the stuff to just work, please. Again, we're an industry with over 70 years of working heritage, and it still doesn't work. We can't keep track of the frames. Mm, that's a bit weird. As an engineer, I want to limit as much as possible unnecessary wrapping unwrapping of media files so that different systems and vendors can interoperate directly. Well, this isn't a technical problem. This is an operation problem. If we can define applications where you use the same format, you wouldn't have to do all of this. So it's not really a vendor problem, and it's not necessarily any one company's problem, but it's a defining the application area problem. As a manager, I want to identify and track derivations of media in a package, yada, yada, yada. In other words, this is a variation on the first one. I'd like to make some stuff, make versions of it, and know that they're all still related. As a file delivery operator, I want to deliver one file readable by all. You're getting a trend here? It's like, I want stuff to work. I want to be able to track it. I want to make sure it works. Um, as a vendor, I want to make a product that creates files to a testable file specification for a market bigger than one broadcaster so that I can spend my engineering doing things that the customer actually values. That'd be nice, because it'd be nice for the vendors to make a buck as well. You can keep driving us down as much as you like, but until we've got an ecosystem that makes sense, it ain't going to happen. So here's my conjecture. I think that the outcome of these user stories will lead to a specification that gives us something that's going to save time and money. And the business benefit of that is going to be some sort of operational cost reduction. It's going to lead to something that prevents unnecessary work, reduction in time and cost. Something that's machine readable, so it reduces the engineering effort. Have you any idea how hard it is to get an engineer to read a thousand pages of handwritten specification and then convert it to code that interoperates with another engineer from Korea whose first language isn't English, who's expected to write it to the same level? It's a silly way of doing things. Something that maintains identities, time code, and other metadata. It's nice to be able to keep track of what you've made. Something that's maintainable. <laughs> It'd be nice if what we wrote today still works tomorrow. That'd be good, eh? Maybe based on some kind of interchangeable media data model. So that we can build a number of these constrained worlds that are testable based upon a data model. Delivery spec that has a range of values in a data model. A test spec that has a different range of values in a data model giving an ecosystem where there's a limited number of machine-readable delivery specs that you could just download, with their corresponding QC templates published. Maybe a more sophisticated FIM service that could automatically transcode based on this written-down data model. Or QC based on the same data model. Or maybe even a sophisticated FIM service that based on this machine definition could actually do the right thing at the right time in an automated way. 
If anybody watching this wants to contribute to those user stories, that's the link. Uh, J.MP1HFXLR3, the L is capital. Fill in as many user stories as you can. The AMWA, SIMPT, and the others will thank you. But better still, join the AMWA, join SIMPT, and be part of the gang that's trying to define this new and better world. I'm Bruce Devlin. Thank you for listening.